Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. So my name is Trisha Hampton. I'm the Rural Revitalization Coordinator for the Rural Development Network. On behalf of Portage College and the Rural Development Network, I want to extend a warm welcome to all of you at our final presentation of the Indigenous Resiliency Speaker Series. This series has been a month long journey where we have explored and celebrated the strength, wisdom and resilience of Indigenous communities. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that this gathering is being broadcast from the, from the traditional lands of First Nation peoples, the owners of Treaty 6, which are also homelands to Métis people. We honour the history and culture of all people who first lived and gathered in these lands. So unfortunately today, the server is down at Portage College and we're not able to have them join us today as they no longer have phone or internet capabilities, but they do have the ability to listen in today, but unfortunately they can't participate. So I'm just gonna let you know that normally, in addition to being virtual, we also would be broadcasting from Portage College's uh, Waniska room. And this is a room that was built from Portage College's Ways of Knowing Cultural Spaces, Cultural, sorry, excuse me, Spaces Initiative. And this was established in 1968, where they had a sit-in held by the First Nations and Métis people, which is a true demonstration of resilience, and they're thankful for that. So they're happy normally to be sharing from that room, um, but today we had this uh, technical difficulty, so they won't be able to. I'm going to talk about a few housekeeping notes to start. Uh, we'd like to ask that you keep your microphone muted during the presentation. If you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat or and also let us know where you're calling or where you're attending from. We'd love to see that information. So please feel free to put things in the chat. After Dr. Ottman is finished her presentation, we will be putting, we'll be having a Q&A session at the end, so we will address any questions at that time, and also to let you know we will be recording this session. I'd like to extend a heartfelt gratitude to our sponsors who make it possible for, a, for us to be able to give this to everybody to see virtually, and that is Pembina Pipeline Corporation and CN. Their generous support has made it possible to offer this speaker series to everybody free of charge and enables us to share these valuable insights without barriers. So thank you very much to our two sponsors for coming aboard, we appreciate you. I'd like to just talk a little bit about Portage College. So Portage College's vision is to empower learners to transform and make a difference. Their mission is to connect people with knowledge, skills and opportunities. They were established in 1968 and their service areas include seven unique campus locations spread across Northeast Alberta. They offer diploma and certificate programs in arts, academic upgrading, business, culinary arts, environmental sciences, health, human services, education and trades. So for more information, you can visit their website at portagecollege.ca. So now I'm going to take a moment to just share with you about Rural Development Network and our role in the collaborative efforts with rural and Indigenous communities across Canada. So I'm very honoured to work for an organization that is learning together on our journey of reconciliation. One way we are doing this is working together with leaders such as Portage College to co-host this speaker series. So who is the Rural Development Network? We're a nonprofit that works across Canada. We focus on rural sustainability and creating tangible community impact. We understand that rural communities have unique needs, challenges, and opportunities. Many programs that are out there are not created and delivered in rural areas, but rather in urban centers. So they don't serve or can't be delivered in a way that rural areas need. And this is a different reality that we have in rural areas in terms of social and economic structures and infrastructure that often doesn't exist or is doesn't exist in very large quantity. So we're looking to increase that capacity. The main things we do overall is we create innovative tools and resources, including guides, 
toolkits, and trainings that are created in partnership with rural communities and organizations and are specifically designed for rural communities. We provide expertise and boost capacity of communities in implementing their own projects. We do advocacy and we help connect people in the sector to share resources and information through events and networks. We also support groups in accessing funding. So if you'd like to learn more about the Rural Development Network, you can visit us at www.ruraldevelopment.ca or you can contact us at uh, info at ruraldevelopment.ca, which will also post the links here in the chat. So today we are so honored to have Dr. Jacqueline Ottman from the First Nations University of Canada with us today. Dr. Ottman is Anishawabi or Salto from Fish Lake First Nation in Saskatchewan. Prior to her academic career, Jackie was an elementary, high school teacher and principal. She remains an engaged scholar alongside her responsibilities as a senior academic leader. While at the University of Calgary, she was the coordinator of the First Nations, Métis, Inuit, undergraduate teacher education program and the Director of Indigenous Education Initiatives with the Workland School of Education. She also co-chaired the WSE's in Indigenous Strategy and alongside the Provost, the University-wide Indigenous Strategy. From her time with the University of Saskatchewan as Professor and Vice Provost Indigenous Engagement, Dr. Jacqueline Ottman was appointed President of the First Nations University of Canada. Ottman, Dr. Ottman has been recognized as an international researcher, advocate, and change maker whose purpose is to transform practices inclusive of Indigenous leadership, methodologies, and methodologies. Jacqueline is driven to create schools and communities that foster a deeper sense of belonging and appreciation for Indigenous peoples, their histories, stories, ways of knowing, and be. Dr. Ottman is also the first Indigenous person to become president of the Canadian Society for the Study of Education. In this presentation, Dr. Jacqueline Ottman will describe and provide a historical overview and future projection of reconciliation based on the concepts of resilience and persistence from a First Nation, Salto perspective. Resilience and persistence are the building blocks for enduring relations between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples and for deep-seated educational and economic reconciliation. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jacqueline Ottman. Thank you so much, Tricia, for, for that introduction. And um, so, um, I guess that means that that I'm starting and um, it's I've just really appreciated the invitation uh, to meet with the uh, Rural Development Network and all of its members. Well, you know, some of its members through this particular forum. And um, I grew up in in um, a rural context uh, in Saskatchewan. And as uh, Trisha had mentioned, it's um, Fishing Lake First Nation, um, and actually what I'll do is I'll begin by saying um, So basically what I, what I um, shared with you is um, I began by saying hello or anin, all, all my relations. Um, I shared with you my traditional name, Motang, and so that was a, a name given to me as an infant by Elder Silverquill from, from our community. Um, and um, this is, I think, the first lesson um, with the um, Plains Ojibwe people, and you've heard different um, different names for Plains Ojibwe, and that's Anishinaabe or, or Soto. 
um, and we migrated west, um, you know, years and years and years ago for many different reasons. But um, so so basically within our community, names are given. You can ask for a name, of course, through proper protocol. Um, you can also um, have an elder approach you um, and, and request a naming ceremony. And that's exactly what happened to me as, as, uh, as an infant, a baby. Um, I had, uh, teenage parents and, um, an elder heard me, um, crying and at the grocery store. And he came up to my parents and said, I know who this is. I have been dreaming about her and I know what her name is. And so the name um, is uh, has to do with an experience. Um, of course, a lot of our indigenous languages are action oriented and in mine has to do with a particular uh, experience with thunder. And, um, and I, rem uh, I remember sharing um, or having that conversation with, with Elder Reg Kroshu from the place that I'm in today, which is Treaty 7 territory, and I appreciate the land acknowledgements that I've seen in the chat. Um, but uh, he he gave me or shared with me the uh, the parallel word for my name in in Blackfoot, um, and then he he actually um, drew um the the kind of thunder that that my name was about and um and so that is uh i again um the names that we have that are given um from elders in our community have tremendous significance because they um they provide us with strength and purpose as as we move through life um I also shared with you um, where I'm from within my language, No Chiganozeaning, which is Fishing Lake First Nation. And that um, is uh, about two hours east of Saskatoon or an hour east of Humboldt, Saskatchewan. And, um, and so, and the last thing I said was uh, just very glad to be here with you today. Um, and um, the title of, of the presentation, as you could see there, is Zongede Ewin, Zongede Ewin, or and Akamenamok. Um, and so Zongede Ewin um, is um, is a Soto word, um, and it means. Um, it's hard to translate again, but you could say that it's resilience. Um, but um, that whole concept, zongade, um, means like it, you've got to have a strong heart um, in order to um, to have resilience. And um, another word that is very similar in both Cree and Soto is akame akamenamoak. Um, and Kree akame akame um, and um, that means that akame uh, means it's more of a directive, and it's it's like this group of people, this community. Um, you all persevere, and akame um, um would mean that um, more of a past tense. You have persevered. Um, and there are many demonstrations of resilience and perseverance of Indigenous peoples um, over over time, and and that's what um, what I'll share with you um, a bit of that today. We can move on to the next slide. Um, for Indigenous peoples, um, there we go. Um, time is uh, not a straight line; it's not linear. As you could see here, um, there is uh, an image of a, a of a spiral um, connected to it's a plant, and um, but this is the um, more of our perception related to time, um, and within every single moment, you have the past, present, and future embedded, and because of that, we have 
responsibility um, to honor our ancestors and to respect humanity and creation, all of our relations today, and um, be mindful and uh, plan for those children not yet born seven generations into the future. Um, so there's a whole lot. This There's this um, concept of biomimicry and um, really what it is is learning from creation um, and um, um, how to relate to each other, how to organize, how to function um, and it's it's interconnected. It's in, inextricably interconnected. Um, and we're learning that more and more, I believe, especially, you know, when you look at the implications of, first of all, the industrial revolution and, um, and, um, capitalism and, you know, on our, on our world today, um, and the, um, the health of, of the earth, we, we know that, um, you know, that's a, can be a direct, um, direct result of, of how we are caring or not caring for our environment. Um, and I also teach in this way. Um, this is how I speak. I, uh, it's not in a straight line. Um, so I, I like to loop back to concepts and um, it's not too often that I finish a PowerPoint presentation um, because, because I start to integrate story into, into the slides. Um, and again, that is, um, um, I, I think, a way that um, of storytelling and communication that I witnessed growing up from, from the elders in my community, and, and you just begin to um, embody that. Um, so we'll move on to the next slide. Um, and even though here it says teacher education, um, the, the idea here is, again, it's, um, it speaks to an Indigenous worldview. Um, and there's a scholar from um, New Mexico, Dr. Gregory Cajete, he's Pueblo, Tewe Pueblo. And he did this, um, this study on, um, on the concept of education. And we know that education and schooling are two different things. And so schooling is bound by, uh, bound by a building, bound by curriculum, bound by um, what um, the instructor or teacher knows. And um, so, so it has limits. Um, whereas education is boundaryless. And, um, and so for Indigenous peoples, the concept of lifelong learning was, um, was a way of life. Um, and for many of us, it is, it is really um, what we experience if we're open to, um, to learning and growth. Um, and so what um, Dr. Kehete found is that um, in the languages of the Southwest, the Indigenous languages, the closest that um, that that he found um, to the concept of education was coming to know. Um, and I've asked students within and you know within leadership um, leadership workshops or um, events what that phrase coming to know means to them. And we won't get into that today, but it's interesting because. Many people say, well, it, it means coming to know myself, coming to know the environment, coming to know, um, you know, just issues. And, and so it's, it's this broader concept of, of coming to know. And so um, we, we encourage that um, for many reasons. And some of our, um, some of our, um, indigenous groups um, and individuals still practice uh, vision quests and um, vision quests um, in, in some of these um, traditions, um, an individual would isolate themselves from a community. And, um, and so, um, 
and go to, as in my community, the elders would say, a clean spot. So a spot that is not contaminated um, and uh, somewhat peaceful. And, uh, and they would spend some time there away from community. And uh, so it's during this time where there's, there's also uh, fasting involved that, that um, the goal is to reach a, a heightened sense of connectivity to not only our, our human relations, but to our, um, to creation in the, in the cosmos during that time. Um, and with that, you would also get a heightened sense of purpose. And uh, many of us heard that phrase, have heard that phrase, um, um, purpose-driven work. And I would say that what I do is very much uh, purpose-driven. And, um, and so I could do um, similar things um, within various contexts. And it's essentially what I've done. The other word there is okanamage. And so um, it also, this word, um, and each one of us are leaders, each one of us are teachers. We're trying to communicate with each other um, important ideas, um, important themes, important messages, important themes. And, or, you know, there's, um, there's a lot that we're trying to communicate and because we each have a circle of influence, um, whether it is determining um, decisions for, for our um, uh, decisions for each one of us individually, but we impact our friends, we impact our children, if we have children, we impact our partners, if we have partners, we impact our work colleagues, and some of us have a wide circle of influence and so you know, with that comes responsibility. And um, there's a whole lot that can be said and taught about Indigenous perspectives on um, on leadership. It's actually the focus of my uh, master's and PhD research study. Um, so it's, it's interesting. But okanamage means also akin is the land. And um, we always acknowledge the relationality that we have to the land. Um, so akin, akina, uh, mioma means the land that we're on. Um, and that last part of that word is a directive. So if you look at that word, um, you know, akinama, again, land is first teacher um, or should be first teacher. And um, it also relates to the longstanding um, relationality that Indigenous people have to place. So I'm in, um, you know, Blackfoot, um, Tutana Dene, um, Stony Nakoda territory, depending on which way I go um, in and around Calgary. And of course, the Métis Nation resides here also. Um, and so, you know, but if I think about the Blackfoot people, they have had an intimate relationship with the land for tens and thousands of years. And so they get this sense, this intuition, these stories, um, and they know the patterns of the land. And this is um, very, very important um, for many reasons. And that's why we acknowledge the people of the land. And, and that is why um, we should also um, be inclusive of those perspectives, because we would be missing out on critical information if we're going to be planning um, into the future, or even for today, um, you know, based on um, the rhythms of the land. And, and there's many stories of, of, of that. And um, an example in my community is um, our lake has a, uh, again, a rhythm. And it's, it's not a five year rhythm. It's probably a 50, 75 uh, your your pattern that it has, and it either rises uh, significantly or or it recedes to the point where you know people get concerned about um, about uh, it about the lake and and um, in the future of the lake. But the elders in our community know that that's that's the rhythm of of our lake. And um, a few years ago, my, my dad was chief of our community for a span of 30 years. 
um, went to the um, to the resort um, associations and, and said, well, the elders um, have informed him to to speak with the associations and to let them know that the lake is going to um, reach um, the upper part of the basin. And many of the homes were built in the 50s um, and um, and the you know the lake has never risen. They built within the rate in the basin um, was the point, and um, people really didn't heed the warning. And um, you know the next year the the lake rose to flood the um, many of the homes. But what uh, the community was doing uh, in the with the province's support was trying to drain the lake, and the elders got um, very upset with that and um, and they did manage to stop the draining of the lake. Um, and then other solutions were to create berms right on the lake. Um, those berms are still there, but um, you know, since then the lake has receded. Many of the homer owners have built above the above the basin. So there is that relationality with the land. And knowing that many people here come from a rural context, um, that is um, something to to be mindful of, and and also recognize that um, that there are generational relationships to to you know to pieces of land that that many um, farmers have or land owners. So again, just partnerships and and collaborations are are essential. Um, next slide, please. And um, one of the um, things that, um, and it was interesting because at Portage College, I heard that um, there was a, a unit called Wanisca. And um, this particular video is called Wanisca. And it was actually um, produced and directed by the Keteak, the elders at First Nations University of Canada. And um, as you could see, it was it's uh, an award-winning film, but um, awakening when it's got like there's, I would say that within since the pandemic, we've had um, we've had global experiences. Um, as humanity, um, experiences that have called us to, to awaken. When you think about the pandemic, um, that was a global experience. And we had to pivot words like pivot came into, we heard that so much, let's, you know, we have to pivot quickly. Um, but we did have to shift quickly um, into a new reality. Um, not only for the health and wellness of each one of us individually, but for whole populations. And we had to learn how to do our work in our homes. And we had to become adept uh, with using technology. And that was an awakening. And for a lot of us, it's, you know, it was an introspective time about uh, perhaps reflections on on values and principles and and what really matters and it worked for some of us and it didn't work for others perhaps those are people who um who thrived um within um the patterns of you know of of work going to work and staying focused at work and differentiating having clear lines between work and home and so that was a wave of awakening. Within that time, also there was the um, the the death, the killing of George Floyd, and that was another awakening because it caused global um, protests. And uh, once again, as humanity, we had to think about race relations. And what are our values and beliefs related to people of difference? And perhaps questioned ourselves, how did we um, get to believing these things? And, um, and are they true? Um, 
I know during this time, what I did um, was lis listen and read as much as I could about, um, about anti-racism. And, um, and so I, I just delved in, into that learning and I had to think, even though, you know, I'm Indigenous and I have experienced racism, um, there was the, um, the, the research, the stories, the, the theory, the, the actions forward that, that I really needed to learn. So that was, again, a human experience, a global human experience. The third awakening um, wave of awakening was um, the discovery of the unmarked graves. Um, in in Canada. And even though these stories were very um, familiar within Indigenous communities, and we've been sharing those stories for, um, for a very long time um, with very little audience, um, the, the shock of, of the findings um, in BC um, was felt all over the world. Um, I know that because I received uh, communication and questions from people in New Zealand and in Australia. How could a peace uh, maker, a uh, peace, I'll say peace loving country like Canada engage in such um, violence uh, to where children's bodies were found within school grounds and even when within um, school buildings in the basements. So, you know, um, that was another wave of awareness and then questions about, um, you know, what what do we do? Um, and um, where, I, I questions that I received during that time is where do I begin? Where do I begin learning? What um, What's the literature that I should be reading? Um, and, um, and so there was this collective, um, generally again, um, desire to learn the truth, um, and, um, make those connections between, um, truth to reconciliation, that reconciliation of any form has to begin with active listening and learning learning the truth, however uncomfortable it is. Um, I remember doing a presentation in Toronto um, that provided a historical timeline of Indigenous peoples, um, you know, since colonization. And there was um, an older woman who came up to me afterwards and said, that couldn't be true, um, what you shared. Like, I, she said, I haven't heard that. Before, this is the first time I heard it, it couldn't be true. Um, so basically at the time, what I said was, um, don't take my word for it. Um, I would hope that that um, she would have done some reading and, and her own research. And, um, and so there is, there is a lot to learn in terms of how we arrived at um, at such um, segregation of indigenous peoples, and um, and once you learn that history, you will um, also understand uh, the current context of indigenous peoples and the implications of of um, residential schools are are still very prominent today. And it's something that we all have to work together on, um, on alleviating. Um, and so with this, I will, um, I will ask for just a small taste of the video. Um, and uh, it is one I think that you could also look for.
Let's go. <laughs> this morning, I'm what I'm doing is I'm calling the uh, students in uh, for the pipe ceremony. Uh, every morning at uh, seven o'clock, we meet in the teepees. There's the uh, the ceremonial teepee here is where they have the pipe, the sacred pipe, and that the elder will be lifting that on behalf of the uh, university and all the students. For some of the students in that, uh, again, for the first time, uh, you know, going to a pipe ceremony, feeling really uh, revitalized, you know, going back to their culture and that is what, who they really are in that. So, I mean, carrying on what our uh, ancestors had passed on to us in that. My grandmother used to go in the springtime and we would collect uh, willow, um, Labrador tea, mint from the lake shores, and um, tamarangs. They're the gummy part of the tamarang and she would bundle it all together and wrap it up and put it in boiling water and simmer it. It would just look like pink lemonade and that medicine we would drink and we never got sick because all of the stuff that was around us they knew how to put it together and they were chemists they were also physicists they learned about the astrology the wind the time the moon but our white brothers and sisters they have to open up a book So all this area over here, yeah, uh, you, you should find lots. Okay. Watch where you step. Um, look for these areas where they had a bale or The context uh, that we're here today is that we are on a learning journey of our traditional medicines, what our old people had used in terms of for healing. They're learning how to harvest. They're learning how to work the land, how to give back to the land. And they become keepers of the land. That's the only way, in fact, we exercise our inherent rights, or if we can call it our treaty rights, because that now we have a reason to protect the land. We understand what the water is for, what, you know, what the landscapes are for, what the animals are for. And, and so we have reasons to protect. You are our future, Nanny. You're the ones that have to go out there and, and speak. Speak for us, speak for our people in that. We have approximately 51 students who are here doing their culture camp, which is a part of the curriculum. And they're here for, for 10 days. It's uh, driven and taught by the elders. And they um, have their teachings and teach the students about ceremonies and also the importance of culture and tradition. And for a lot of students, it's their first time and their first introduction to um, a traditional knowledge base. So we'll go back to the, to the PowerPoint. And, um, and so that gives you um, an indication of, of what we do at First Nations University of Canada, um, but also um, perhaps, um, well, I do know other um, learning institutions um, engage in land-based learning. So it's, um, it's, it's understanding the, the, the rhythms of our environment um, and um, in learning about the complexity and sophistication of Indigenous intellect and knowledges. And, um, and so a misconception is, and we've heard uh, various uh, misconceptions and stereotypes that have been recycled over century, centuries, and one of them is that um, Indigenous peoples are primitive, and if they're primitive, that means that um, that you know our intellect is um, is not equal, and that we have nothing to contribute. But um, in reality, once you start to um, learn about 
indigenous philosophies and and practices you will um you will learn learn and know that uh there is tremendous complex complexity and sophistication um within indigenous um knowledges so depending on the community you know one thing that you will learn if you meet an indigenous person and if you met my grandmother who's now passed away one of the things that she would ask you is uh, so it's like who are you um um where uh that second one is a lot again more cons it's asking not only who you are but where you come from and um it's there's this birthing practice within within many of our communities where the umbilical cord is either hung on, on a tree or 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 placed on you know an, again a clean place or on um in so it it just indicates um the the people you're from um the um the the land that you originate from and um and so um indigenous peoples um when we meet we 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 like to learn about who you are where you come from um who your parents are who your if you're again indigenous to indigenous who your grandparents are um and it's interesting i've been in australia and have met um a nephew that I haven't met before um, through conversation at a conference, right? So it's an invitation to um, to relationality um, and to um, to friendship. Um, so it it may seem kind of forward. My my mom is very forward this way, um, but but it's actually a good thing and. Um, in this time of, and some of you may have seen it, but the focus on, um, or the the news um, that has uh, highlighted some cases of identity fraud, um, it's, we as Indigenous peoples have had um, longstanding practices of, of, of uh, identity related to identity. And um, and the authentic uh, authenticity of that identity. Um, so this is this is a common practice even today. Um, next slide, please. Try to move through this uh, next little bit fairly quickly. And um, another thing that um, I I use four questions um, over and over and over again. You could call them leadership questions. You can call them identity ex existential questions. I have actually framed um, strategic plans, um, in particular, the University of Saskatchewan strategic plan on these four questions. And it's, um, who am I? Where am I going? What is my responsibility? Um, okay, who am I? Where am I from? What is my responsibility? Um, why am I getting this wrong? Who am I? Where do I come from? Uh, where am I going? What is my responsibility? So as organizations and communities and societies can say, who are we? Where do we come from? Where are we going? What are our responsibilities? And, um, and so, you know, part of in creating bridges of reconciliation, um, we need to know who we are, um, who are Indigenous peoples. And um, Indigenous peoples have had to um, have had to step into mainstream society and, and you know uh, learn um, those ways of knowing, being, and doing. Um, but it hasn't been too often that um, you know mainstream or dominant society has had has engaged in that kind of learning. Um, learning about who Indigenous peoples are, our ways, our practices, our traditions. And so we have to meet in the middle. We have to, um, we have to meet in the middle in order to, 
to engage in, in um, meaningful reconciliation. So we'll move on to the next slide, please. And um, this is kind of, um, I could throw a lot of literature at you and, um, and some authors like J.R. Miller and um, When Skyscrapers Hide the Heavens. Like that's a really good book that speaks to what he um, identifies as, as Indian white relations. And he uses those terms because they're in primary documents. Um, and so um, this is just an example of a Cree elder in the early 1800s, a taka coop or star blanket, and, um, and how inviting some of our leaders were. Um, but you could see that, um, you know, in that time, he said, we live in a beautiful world, the spirit of the creator, his energy is part of all things in this world. There's nothing else, yet it is all things. Everything that exists is a part of nature and has a reason and purpose. So that sense of purpose was there. We'll move on to the next, um, next slide. And um, so what he did at Taka Group is um, he invited um, uh, teachers into the community, but the, the intention was that the whole community would be learning um, from, from these teachers. And, um, and so as we know, what happened um, was that the children um, were, were segregated for that learning. Um, and eventually came the, the mandatory um, legislation of schooling for, for Indigenous children. Um, next slide, please. Um, and so there is another leader, Shingwa Kuso, it means Little Pine. Um, he had um, 13 or three, three goals in um, um, three goals in 1830. He was um, for his community, as you could see here, one of them is obtain, obtain external aid for developing the range of First Nations technical skills. Um, and so that, um, if you look at these goals um, in today's context, we can we can um, see how much we've we've gained. Um, since 1830. And the second point there is devise new ways of protecting the band's resource space. Um, the sad part of this story is that um, the land base for this particular community um, shrunk significantly um, during Shingoan Kuz's lifetime. Third one, establishing new linkages with what he perceived to be both spiritual and political um, sources of the white man's strength. So there is this desire to engage in the economy, um, the desire to, um, to learn and, and, um, and to, um, to attend schooling. I'm using schooling versus education. Um, so uh, to be contributors of, of this, um, this new change that's happening within, within the landscape. Um, so misconception is that, um, that, you know, there's many misconceptions that's connected, um, connected to this and that, um, some stereotypes, um, have emerged that indicate that indigenous peoples don't want to work, um, don't want to be a part of the e economy, that education is free for us, um, and in all actuality, it's it's a huge competition um, for for people who want to attend post secondary education within our communities because there's 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 a budget, there's a limit to the amount of people that that a community can support for post secondary education. Um, so you know this can be impacted um, significantly. Next slide, please. So we're still in the who are we part. Um, and again, this is the who are we part. And, you know, we just um, we just um, went through National Truth and Reconciliation Day. And also it's it coincides with Orange Shirt Day. Right. And the um, the stories that are connected to um, the abuse 
um, that occurred within residential school um, are many. And um, the youngest, uh, I heard one story a couple of days ago and the youngest, um, can't even say child baby that was taken to residential school was three years old. Um, so babies were taken. Um, my grandfather um, attended at the age of eight because his family hid um, the children up until that point. So, you know, it's it's just violent. It's it's unbelievable for some people to to hear that things like this happened. And this particular image um, is you could see the teepees at the outside the fence and um, parents and relatives camped outside residential schools um, so they can get a glimpse of their children. Um, they couldn't go in. It was all to get a glimpse of their children. And um, eventually they stopped coming because it was too difficult um, to not touch and be with your child. Um, next slide, please. So the implications, as I said, we're still suffering the implications of, of this kind of separation in many of our communities um, and our um, organizational structures. Um, our kinship systems place children at the center um, in every, every, the parents, the aunties, the uncles, the grandparents, they are all there to nurture and support um, the, the growth of children. And so the last straw, um, you know, when you're talking about waves, um, you contain people within certain boundaries, small boundaries, where they had all of these, you know, these lands to, uh, to roam and hunt and migrate and travel and all of a sudden you're you're in a um, a small boundary and you have one person who controls the economy the Indian agent you he sold your produce um, he sold your livestock and maybe you got a portion of of what came back you couldn't leave that bounded community unless you had a pass. So how could we engage in the economy? Um, couldn't have a lawyer, it was illegal. Um, and if you left um, for post-secondary, that meant that you lost your membership to, to your community um, and your relations. Many of our soldiers fought for Canada and came back um, without those, um, those memberships and they weren't given the compensation as other um, as as other military people did. So all of this is within the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation website. I would suggest that you just kind of browse through there and there is the images, the photos por portion. You'll see photos, you'll see photos of documents, primary documents also. Um, and that's where you'll also see that um, children who died in the schools, their stories um, were um, documented under um, mining and resources. Um, so they weren't categorized as people, but mining and resources. So all of that is, is um, within that particular website. Next slide, please. I know we're running out of time here very quickly. Um, so this is really, um, the treaties do provide a framework of, of relationship. And as you could see the medal there, um, you have two proud people. Um, there's the stance, the tomahawk is on the ground. So that's peace. Um, the handshaking is friend friendship. And it also signifies respect. Um, and so, you know, there's, um, I've had students and people uh, critique this and say, well, yeah, there's um, the bridge is demonstrated by by the connection of hands, by the handshake. And um, and so there's a lot to be considered if we start delving into um, the principles and um, the two contracts contrasting uh, perspectives of the treaties for non for the leaders uh, that represented the crown, 
this was a transaction um, for the seeding of land. Um, for indigenous peoples, the treaties was covenantal and it was about sharing resources and sharing the lands. Two different worldviews. Um, and, um, you know, as we know about worldviews, more about worldviews today, um, it's we're starting to understand that, um, you know, the the opposing um, the opposing perspectives here, and how do we um, how do we honor the treaties um, with such um, difference? Um, of, of perspective. So that's that's definitely a question that that um, that many people are trying to answer today. Next slide, please, please. Um, and so change, um, I my area of, of study again is leadership and organizational theory and change management and uh, primarily from indigenous perspectives, but Rosalind Torres, you can find this in a TED talk too, but um, she studied um, leaders, leaders internationally. And she said that um, the most influential or uh, effective leaders could answer these three questions. Um, where are you looking to anticipate the next change to your working model or your life? So you're always anticipating change. Um, our creation func functions as an open system, as an open model, um, always open to uh, adapting um, with new information. The second question is, what is the diversity measure of your personal and professional stakeholder network? Um, we know that with technology today and algorithms that we're being fed um, um, things that meet our pattern. And um, and so, um, you know, we we can't really think outside that particular box. We have to be very intentional about that. And um, we also do know that diversity actually strengthens organizations. Um, and um, and so there's many examples of that. The third question is quite profound. And it asks, are you courageous enough to abandon a practice that has made you successful in the past? And this may be related to how, um, how you thought of Indigenous peoples. Um, and, and it may mean that, um, you know, you're inspired to, to challenge misconceptions and stereotypes that, um, that were imposed upon us. And so there's, you know, um, depths to these questions. Okay, so I'll just go for another three minutes and then we'll have questions. Um, next slide, please. And um, the the thing again, and this is going to, going back, introducing those questions again, uh, looping back to the questions is um, one end game, you know, who am I, who are we? Where do we come from? Um, where do I come from? Where am I going? Where are we as society, as Canadians going? Um, what are our responsibilities? And so we begin with where we're at. What is our baseline understanding? Um, and, you know, just really focusing on that and then um, charting a path forward. Next next slide, please. Um, and I did this 10 years ago, but, um, you know, for myself, where am I going? It's, it has to do with creating ethical spaces, and that's bringing people, diverse minds together to have these very um, um, serious and maybe not serious conversations, um, but they all relate to decision making. So this is an exercise that you could do um, for yourself. This is just my answer to this particular question. We'll move on. And uh, to the next slide. And my responsibility, this is my answer to the question, yours will be different, but is to share my story, to listen to other people's stories. And my responsibility is to all my relations. So this is beyond humanity. 
um, and including humanity and to seven generations before and after me. Um, and so to my answers, ancestors and ensuring that I leave, do my best to, to leave um, the world um, a better place. Um, and that's just a tiny little drop when we think of an individual, but collectively we could do great things. The, um, the next slide just really speak to the roadmap and, you know, um, there's legal and ethical and moral reasons for us to engage in relationship um, defined by the concept of reconciliation. Um, next slide. Um, the roadmap here are certain documents, right, that provide us with deep understanding um, and guidance in terms of, of what we need to be doing, what we should be doing. Um, and Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples is the most extensive, comprehensive study um, that was done in Canada. I think 4,400 recommendations, 44 of those fall under um, education. And those recommendations are still relevant today, but we, many people have discounted our cap when we shouldn't. The other thing, of course, is truth and reconciliation calls to action. And then, um, and UNDRIP, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And, um, and so it's, um, again, you know, when you look at these documents, how do they make you feel? Because learning is emotive. And um, do you feel threatened with when words emerge like, uh, indigenous people have the right to, um, you know, education, um, self-determination, right? And um, and I, I think, you know, those forms of defensiveness or fear uh, of the unknown uncertainty can be alleviate, alleviated not only through learning, but um, by coming together and having these conversations as I said, um, our philosophies are based on relationality um, and connectivity. Um, they're actually healing philosophies. And, um, and so, you know, those that, that fear, that uncertainty um, might, would be alleviated if we engage in dialogue together in conversation. So um, with that, um, there is tons more here, and I, I knew that I wasn't going to get through the presentation, but um, I will um, uh, share this presentation if anyone would like to engage in more learning. Part of it does have to do with the importance of First Nations University within the educational landscape, but um, one of the things that uh, Thomas King said um, he said, um, take this story, for instance, it's yours. Do with it what you will, tell it to your friends, turn it into a television movie, forget it, but don't say in the years to come that you would have li lived your life differently if only you had heard this story. Um, so this is, um, I always um, see these opportunities as, um, as sharing a gift um, to who's ever listening. Um, but uh, with that, and uh, we have a few minutes for questions. Thank you, Dr. Ottman. We really appreciate your presentation. And I just wanna thank you for your commitment to lifelong learning. I really appreciated hearing about the land-based learning as well and the importance of it. So we'll open up the floor. If anybody has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or you can unmute yourself and, and feel free to ask your question. Doesn't look like we have anything yet. I just wanted to comment, uh, Dr. Upman, I really appreciated when you mentioned um, how we had to be courageous enough to abandon a practice that had made us successful in the past. That one really stuck with me. So I thank you for sharing that because I think we often don't look at those type of things and how important it is to really in our learning and to move forward, to be courageous enough to look at those types of things. 
And I really appreciated those four questions, like, who am I? Where do I come from? Um, where am I going? And then what are my responsibilities? I think that's something we can all ponder and really determine what we think our responsibilities would be. Does anybody, I'll just look in the chat here. Does anybody have a question? We have some comments saying, thank you for the great presentation. Um, and there's some people did want the entire presentation as well. So thank you very much for uh, that. Uh, Lisa, we'll go to you. Hi, um, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I wanted to ask, I'm with the Rural Development Network as well. And, um, you know, as a team and as an organization, we're really trying to engage um, together in learning and being intentional about um, learning about the, you know, truth and reconciliation and the calls to action and also connecting our work to those calls to action and seeing how um, in our day to day and in our projects, how we might be able to um, contribute and work towards those. And I was just wondering if you have any recommendations, you know, I, I don't know if there are other organizations also in, in, embarking on that. And if you have any recommendations or things to consider or keep in mind as we work on that as a team moving forward. Um, there are um, a lot of amazing resources. As, as I said, um, there's a National Center for Truth and Reconciliation and their website is uh, fairly in depth. Um, and, um, you know, in terms of Indigenous research and literature and authors, um, what I do find is that um, even within our libraries, there's a section devoted to Indigenous now. Um, so, so that's important. And, um, and there are more and more um, uh, movies um, and videos that are available for um, for learning, and I always delve into. Uh, and I did share his um, some of his insights. Uh, Dr. Gregory Kahete, and that's C A J E T E. You can find his videos online, um, and there's a, of course other videos. Um, Dr. Leroy Little Bear, he's got. He's got videos online, Dr. Marie Baptiste. Um, you know, again, these are lectures. Marie Baptiste, there's there's those videos, and um, it's um, there's there's just a wealth of knowledge. And um, we have um, um, ICEC, so it's uh, Indigenous Center for Continuing Education, and um, our most uh, popular program is Four Seasons of Reconciliation, and it's asynchronous. So you can you can um, you can uh, engage in that program at your own pace. Uh, I think it's four hours long, so it's manageable, right? And um, and so we've had large corporations and banks like uh, the Royal Bank of Canada um, has purchased um, the um, purchased uh, the program for all of their employees. Um, and we've also had them purchase for a, um, a length of time, any, any Canadian who wanted to um, engage in that program for free. So they paid for, for all of that. Um, and so that is, and you could just look up First Nations University of Canada, ICEC. There's another program, it's a new one, it's called uh, Real Conciliation. And it what it does in both instances is that there are videos. So you hear elders talking, you hear um, just uh, prominent leaders um, and teachers that that are also sharing. Um, so University of Alberta has also a free free program um, for for people. And this is, of course, if it's online, it, anyone in the world can access this learning. Thanks for sharing those resources. Now, I think you might have answered this question, but I'll still ask it in case there's some uh, information you want to add. Uh, Everett asks, what is the best space to find Indigenous resources for learning? I usually turn to the library to learn, but I'm wondering if this is a true representation of Indigenous learning. Yeah, I mean, if it is, um, um, 
written by an indigenous person, um, I would say that it would be in rep representation of a, a perspective, right? A lot of what I do um, and speak, the space that I speak from is from an Anishinaabe perspective. So, um, you know, it's kind of limited, although there are very general things that I that I do say that that hold true for um for um indigenous people groups in Canada. Um so it's you should always understand that there is such diversity within the indigenous population. Um that and that's good. That's a good thing. Um, but the more you learn, you will also be able to um to uh, pick out the the connective threads between between our indigenous nations. Thank you. Um, so just a question I had for you then is um, you had a lot of great information, but what are the couple of key learnings that you really want people to take away from today from what you were just speaking to us? Um, yeah, I think uh, a key learning, you know, anyone who's probably under the age of 25, I'll say, um, hasn't had a very strong um, educational experience um, related to Indigenous knowledges and histories um, because our elementary and high school programs were, um, were silent or that information may have been presented to students from a non-Indigenous perspective. So we have a lot of learning to do and um, and um, and that's I think really important that we um, that we don't um, um, share the burden or give the burden to Indigenous peoples to um, to educate or to be the only source of education. And, um, and so there has to be this commitment um, to learn um, on our own or through these programs that, that I had um, introduced and there's more. Um, and, and of course, to, um, to engage in relationship with indigenous peoples. There are amazing events that are open to the public, right? Powwows are open to the public. We had the largest, a large powwow that was hosted by First Nations University of Canada in Regina. And um, the attendance from the community was significant this year. Um, so people are, are wanting to learn, they're wanting to experience. And so look for those, um, those experiential opportunities also. Thank you for that. So it looks like that's it for our question and answer period. So I just want to take a moment to thank you very much, Dr. Ottman, for your very insightful and powerful presentation. We really appreciated hearing from you and we look forward to seeing the PowerPoint and learning even more from it. So thank you very much. I also want to thank everyone for attending our final presentation in our Indigenous Resiliency Speaker Series. We sincerely hope that you have found the series informative and engaging. Once again, we extend our heartfelt gratitude to each and every one of you for being here today. The recordings of the Indigenous Resiliency Speaker Series will be hosted on both the Portage College and the Rural Development Network's YouTube channels for those of you who wish to view them again or share them with your colleagues. So again, thank you, Dr. Ottman, and have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Take care. <laughs>